Hi friends, welcome to another monthly wrap up. Today we are wrapping up October. I honestly wasn't sure if I was gonna do this video because October felt just as slumpy as September. But I finished on a high, I broke through to the other side, cue the doors music, and I cannot wait to share with you the books that I read because I, I didn't realize that I read some really great books. And my last book was incredible. But the slump is officially over. If you're new here, hi, my name is Angela. I am based in Perth, Western Australia, and I talk about books. Every month I do a bit of a wrap up of what books that I have read for the month, and I might talk a little bit about what my month was like. This month I'm gonna share with you four books that I read in October and I'm going to share with you a few books that I just bought that I cannot wait to get to in the month coming. So let's get into it. First up, what I read in October, and I'm going to kind of start backwards. I'm going to start with the book that I finished last because I feel it was the book that got me out of the slump and I just finished it this morning and I, I really cannot wait to share it with you. Dusk by Robbie Arnott. This book was just released in October, if not late September, I pre-ordered it. I have never read a Robbie Arnott book before. I've always wanted to. I felt like I was drawn to his writing because he's an Australian writer. He writes about Australia. He writes about Australian people. He writes about our landscape, our nature, our wildlife. He seems to have a really strong credibility with I don't know, it's it's nature writing most definitely, but it is not in the same vein as nature writing that I've read in, you know, with like the English writers that I've read. It's something very different. It's much more modern and contemporary. But I've hesitated reading Robbie Arnott because there is also a sense of magical realism. And to date, I have not had good luck with magical realism. But Robbie Arnott's magical realism on the scale of magical realism in this book, it's like a 20%. It's not like the ones that I have read before have been on a scale, they've been like 90%. And that's just too much for my brain to handle. This one is digestible. I was able to handle this one very, very easily. So Robbie Arnott is still very new on the literary scene. I, I was surprised to find that he's, this is his fourth book. And his first book was only just released in 2018. So he's still very, very new. He's a fairly young guy. I don't think he's in his 40s yet. He lives in Tasmania, but his writing is wonderful. So let's get into what Dusk is about. Our main characters, Iris and Floyd, who are twins, have always been around the lowlands and they've really been vagrants. They grew up in a life of crime, their parents were not good people, and Iris and Floyd just trying to find work, and they've come across this information that there is a bounty on the head of a puma named Dusk that is killing people in the highlands. And so they are making their way up to the highlands to see what they can find out about this, and they are very unprepared for this journey. They don't even have a rifle, they don't have any kind of arms on them at all but they need money they need work and there's no work going around at all they take this journey into the highlands and they start to become quite affected by it and especially iris iris is really affected by the beauty of the country and there's a particular passage where she you start to feel that she realizes how wonderful the country is but she knows that she can't stay there as they rode iris tried not to let the land affect her tried not to let its soft colors seep into her she reminded herself that she would be leaving it behind her soon, either through the jaws of dusk or with more money than she'd ever dreamed of. She worked hard to see ugliness in the tumbled rocks and soggy ground, death in the fossilised bones. It was bad country, she told herself, that couldn't be grazed or ploughed. She tried to see bleakness and stark misery all around her, and when she couldn't, she rode with eyes closed, trusting her horse, telling it in a small voice that it was clever and that she loved it. And so Iris is really affected by this landscape. She really does find it a place that she could call home, but there's no work. And so anyway, they're on this bounty looking for this puma dusk. And as we go through the book, we start to, we start to uh, experience what Iris and Floyd's background is. And it's really such a beautiful little story. There's a few little twists and turns. It's a very, very small list of characters, but they are very impactful for us as well as for Iris and Floyd. And there is this one thing that, there is something in the book that I didn't realize because I pre-ordered it, so I hadn't picked it up in a bookstore. But as I was reading through the book, 
I saw on the spine that there was these black marks. And then I realized that there were these black pages. And I was like, what? And so I was halfway through the book and I just was fascinated thinking, what, 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 what's going to happen? What's, what's, what? what's going on here and I have to say this these if you read this book when you get to these this moment with these black pages it is a it is a, such a unique storytelling device it kind of captivated me because I didn't realize that they were there initially and then you just have these passive these <laughs> black pages it was such a unique device as part of the story and I really really found it fascinating I loved Dusk. I didn't quite give it a five star because there was, I felt a little bit let down by some things around. After the, the black pages, I thought something was happening and it didn't quite. And I felt a little bit let down, like maybe we should have gone somewhere we didn't. But I really enjoyed this book. It was just on the cusp of a five star read for me. I highly recommend it. I am most definitely going to be picking up another Robbie Arnott book. I am not afraid of his writing anymore. I will be probably picking up maybe Limberloss next, which I think might be one of his most popular books. But he has a he only has four books, including Dusk, so it's a very small back catalogue to go through. But this was a wonderful read and it's really given me a lot of motivation to pick up I can't wait to pick up my next book I can't wait so the first book that I actually finished for the month was Frankenstein I mentioned this in my Halloween starter pack I was halfway through I can't remember how far half how far through but it was my first time reading it and I decided that I wanted to read it as part of that project for Halloween what other month of the year are you going to read it other than October and it was my first time reading it I decided to get this edition which I think is based on the 1831 text and it is a beautiful edition it is from Alma Books and I really recommend this edition if you have not read Frankenstein before it is there are so many editions out there. It can be quite daunting if you haven't picked up Frankenstein before. This one is really good. At the start of the book, it has some imagery around Mary Shelley herself, her parents, Percy Shelley. It also has some images with the original transcripts. But then it also has at the very, very back, it has like a timeline of the manuscript itself of so Mary Shelley's life timeline and then the manuscript itself so when it was first created uh, and then the drafts it went through and then the rewrite it went through in the 1831 edition it has a foreword from Mary Shelley explaining what the differences in in the 1831 text compared to the 1818 text which was the first one anyway that's a whole other conversation I didn't want to get too into the weeds because I felt like that was an, an, an entirely other project was to really investigate the different editions. I wanted to read the one that Mary Shelley re-edited because I felt like there had to be a reason behind it. So I went with the 1831 text and this was a really great edition. So the first thing I would say is if you have not read Frankenstein but you have an idea that you think you know what Frankenstein is about, you don't. It is nothing at all like what Hollywood has told us it is about. There is no lightning. There is no, it's alive. There is nothing like that happening in here. It starts off as letters from a Captain Walton writing to his sister. So it is not even Victor Frankenstein. It is nothing to do with Frankenstein. And Captain Walton is on a, a I think it's an icebreaker or a ship. Anyway, he is writing to his sister. It's just like he's, you know, just talking about what's going on. And he explains that they have picked up a traveller who is Victor Frankenstein. And Victor Frankenstein is on the verge of death. He has been pursuing the creature and he has been found. He is being looked after. He is being nurtured. He is now relaying to Captain Walton his story, which is the story of Frankenstein as we know it, which is the story about Victor Frankenstein, who is the scientist, who goes away to college, who is intrigued with the idea of life and death and the, the constant pursuit of knowledge. Frankenstein is this allegorical tale of playing God. And he tells this story to Captain Walton. So while we're reading the story, Frankenstein is telling his story to Captain Walton. It is 
quite heart wrenching at times. The the writing is really really lovely. I did find at times it got a little bit wordy for me, which I think is quite often the case with a lot of older texts. Writing from the 1800s can be a little bit like that, but you get through it. And I I really did enjoy it. I really did enjoy reading this. There was a lot of moments that were just like. They were like lightning bolts for me where they just hit you like a ton of bricks. Some of the language and the words were just so beautiful. And to know that Mary Shelley wrote this at the age she did was astounding. But I don't think there's much more I can really add to the entire conversation about Frankenstein other than saying that if you feel like you, if you feel like it is beyond you, please give it a go. It is not that complicated. It is very easy to read. The letters from Captain Walton, I think there might be three, four, five at the beginning. So at first you're like, come on, let's get to it. And then the story picks up. It's really wonderful. And I love this edition. But that was a bucket list moment for me. I've always wanted to read Frankenstein and I did it. Okay, uh, this, the next book I picked up was Pages for Hawk by Helen MacDonald. Now, th- this was part of my spring TBR and I wanted to read this for a variety of reasons. I think for me, one of the reasons I wanted to pick it up was, first of all, I love nature writing. And this, I understood, had a, had a great amount of nature writing and the, the writing itself was really beautiful. Secondly, this book is written as a memoir after Helen has lost her father and my father passed away about five months ago. And so I knew that there would be an element, a connection in that sense. So I wanted to experience that. So... This book was revelatory for me. It was really, really beautiful. I really enjoyed reading it. I will most definitely read it again. It, I get a little emotional now just thinking about it, to be honest. But this book was so surprising. There were so many elements in here I did not know were going to happen. So first of all, we meet, we meet Helen. She is a university lecturer. Unfortunately, her father passes away quite suddenly. And we experience her going through that loss and that heartbreak. And at some point during that, she decides that she is, as part of this grieving grieving process, she's finally, she's just going to finally achieve this lifelong dream of raising a goshawk and rearing it and training it and hunting with it. And it's something she's always wanted to do. And she is not like coming into this as a complete novice. She has experience with hawks and birds and falconry. She, she has experience with it but she has not raised a goshawk before and so she ends up tracking down some guy she ends up paying something like 800 pounds and it was quite funny when she is presented with a hawk he turned up with two hawks and he brings out a hawk which was this quite light much smaller hawk and she thought this is beautiful it's so gorgeous and light and this is perfect this is my hawk And then he brings out another hawk, which is much bigger, much bigger. And she describes the hawk as a Victorian melodrama coming out of its cage. And then she realizes that that is her hawk. She ends up talking the seller into giving her the other hawk, which she calls Mabel. There's a bit of a, not a superstition, something along those lines among falconers that generally the hawks are given very, very soft names, you know, like Fifi and Tickles. And so Mabel is the name that she gives to her hawk. And so she goes on this journey with Mabel and it is beautifully written, but Side parallel to that story, she is also telling the story of another falconer, another um, person who wrote a book called The Goshawk, who was named T. H. White. And T. H. White is more well known for having written The Sword in the Stone. And he has his own story, but she she tells it very well in here. And I it's it's so interesting that there are there are three stories being told in here. There is her her journey of grieving her father, there is her journey of rearing and hunting with a hawk, and then there is her telling T.H. White's story as well. I really did enjoy it. It was quite quite wonderful. But the writing is beautiful. It really is lovely. And I, I, th- I think I mentioned this in a recent video that I also listened to the audiobook on occasion and the audiobook was narrated by Helen and it was just beautiful. So if you are into audiobooks, I would recommend it. 
But I, I do think I'm going to read this again. Some of the writing is just so extraordinary. The descriptions of Mabel are really wonderful. The reptilian, the descriptions of how she describes how Mabel reacts to things and the reptilian descriptions of, you know, a bird, the, the way a bird has these reptile movements is really descriptive and it's it's such a wonderful book. She goes through her grieving process as she's taming this bird and in that process she starts to go through her own, I think the book calls it her own untaming and there is just something, there is just something so raw and real about it and I, I could not recommend it more. This was a five star read for me. I highly, highly recommend it. And then the last book that I read in October was The Penelope Ad by Margaret Atwood. I actually read this one before dusk and I finished this in a day. It is a very, very small book. It is less than 200 pages. It's 199 pages. It's essentially a retell, a Greek myth retelling. And it is a retelling of Penelope, who is the wife of Odysseus. And so in the Greek myths, uh, Penelope is abandoned essentially when Odysseus goes to fight in the Trojan War. He's gone for 10 years and he fights in the war. But then after the war, he is gone. Everyone has come back. Everyone's come back to their homes and their wives and they've gone back to their lives. But Odysseus doesn't come back. As, as the Odyssey tells it, he goes on into his own journey, into his Odyssey. But no one understands where he is. She doesn't know where he's gone. So she's left alone for 20 years and this story is a retelling of her story and I, I don't know how to feel about this book. So as part of the mythology, when Odysseus returns back to his kingdom, he finds that Penelope is still there. She's being pursued by all these suitors who are wanting to marry her. She has been resisting against them for a decade but she has been asking her handmaids, she's got uh, 12, she had 12 maidens that she was asking to spy on these suitors to make sure that, so she was trying to keep up to date with what their plans were. And so when Odysseus comes back, he kills all of these suitors because they're trying to usurp his kingdom. They essentially want to marry Penelope so they get all of his kingdom. But he also then kills the handmaids or the, the maid the handmaids, the maidens. And so Margaret Atwood is kind of looking for an angle of uh, their story about how they were unjustly killed. The summary on the back says, uh, in a contemporary twist to the ancient story, Margaret Atwood has chosen to give the telling of it to Penelope and to her 12 hanged maids asking what led to the hanging of the maids and what was Penelope really up to. She's giving Penelope a voice and I haven't read The Odyssey and I really do want to read it. Again, it's one of those things I think that I've been daunted by, but I probably shouldn't. I think there are some great translations out there that are really quite easy to digest. So I do, I do want to read it. I don't know. I haven't read The Odyssey, but I could see that there were points that she was pointing out saying, this is what it says in the Odyssey, but this is really what Penelope thought. Sure, um, in the Odyssey it says Penelope was surprised that uh, Odysseus had arrived back and she was shocked and horrid and humbled. And in the book it's saying oh, Penelope knew that it was him because she's not that stupid to not know that it was him in disguise. And I just kind of was like, I don't know. I really, I just didn't quite buy it. I felt like she was trying to turn nothing into something. I read, I read it. I enjoyed it. It was an interesting story. It was well, well written. I kind of enjoyed the, the telling of it. There's always a part of Greek mythology is that they are the men's stories and the women are just supporting characters to it and they don't seem to have their own voice. I understand that, but it was a bit predictable. Maybe that's it. So anyway, I read it. I think I'd maybe give it around three stars or so. So those were the books that I read. At the end of the day, I was pretty happy with this selection of books for the month, especially when I said, like I read these two at the very, very start of the month and then I just kind of had a bit of a, a bit of a slump for a week and a half to two weeks and then I read the Penelope ad in like on a Sunday and then dusk over the last few days. So I'm through. I'm through the slump. So now I want to share with you a few books that I have just bought recently that I'm looking forward to reading in the next month or two. They're definitely summer reads for me. Uh, the first one I got was something I've been looking for for a while and I managed to find it in a secondhand store just this week. 
and I've got this incredible secondhand bookstore just five minutes from where I work so often I'll pop in there you know on my lunch break or something and just browse which is such a great you know release for your mind and I managed to find this beautiful pristine edition of Susan Sontag's On Photography. I've shared with you before that I was a photographer. I was a wedding photographer for about 13 years. I started my career as a photographer because it was formed out of a hobby. It was a passion that I had and I, I was good enough to turn that into a career for 13 years and I stopped doing that because of a variety of reasons but mainly because I no longer needed to do it. I didn't need to work for myself and I was very very fortunate that I finished my business. I exited my business. My last wedding was actually um, cancelled because of COVID. So I was out of it before the ramifications of the coronavirus, whereas a lot of my friends in the wedding industry, their businesses were so heavily hit because of it. So I was so fortunate to have already exited by that point. But anyway, since I exited, since I stopped doing photography as a business, I have found it a struggle to pick up a camera and do it, do photography for fun. I turned what I loved into a business and that really made it difficult to do it for fun for me. So I've heard wonderful things about this book and it's really about why we photograph for pleasure, why we document things, what what we do with those things that we document. And I really do want to read it to try and I, I feel like it's something that I want to get back into in some way. And especially when it comes to documenting me. And it's something that a lot of it was there was quite a movement a long time ago in the photography world about getting mum back in the kit picture, you know, like there is the there's always someone that is behind the camera and they're never in the picture. And I just really want to maybe try and figure out a way to get back in the picture personally for my own personal photography collection. So at the end of my days, there is some evidence of my being on this earth. I really want to read this perspective of photography, why we photograph, why we do it as a collective, as a, you know, as a species. 220 pages, so it's very small, but um, that's maybe something for nonfiction November. And on the recommendation of one of you guys, I went and picked up Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. It was actually someone named Kim, so thank you, Kim, for your recommendation. She was very adamant. On my video that I shared about eight authors that I hadn't read, she was like, of all the authors on your list, drop everything, go buy Wolf Hall, stop everything, go buy it, go read it, you'll love it. So while I didn't stop everything just to go and read it, I did stop everything to go and buy it. So thank you, Kim. This is going to be my summer project. I am going to read this over the summer. This is my big book, summer book. So uh, I'm excited to get into this. I also went and got Stoneyard Devotional by Charlotte Wood. Charlotte Wood uh, is an Australian author and her book has been shortlisted for the Booker Prize. The Booker Prize is, I think, being announced on the 12th of November. So I've decided I'm going to read James, I'm going to read Stoneyard Devotional before the Booker Prize is announced. From what I've heard, Stoneyard Devotional is a little bit of a dark horse and it could, I think amongst all of the books that have been shortlisted, I think a lot of people are saying this could be the one that would, uh, could take it out and be the, be the surprise winner. I really, I've read a Charlotte Wood book before and I did enjoy it. She has a way of writing that is very true. Like there is just a way of her forming sentences and structures that makes you go, that you understand it, you you feel it. And it's maybe it's something that you have felt before or you, you've been in that position, but you've never really thought of putting it to a sentence. And she has a way of doing that. A woman abandons her city life and marriage to return to the place of her childhood holding up in a small religious community hidden away on the stark plains of the Monaro. She does not believe in God, doesn't know what prayer is, and finds herself living this strange, reclusive life almost by accident. As she gradually adjusts to the rhythm of monastic life, she finds herself turning again and again to the thoughts of her mother, whose early death she can't forget. Disquiet interrupts this secluded life with three visitations. First comes a terrible mouse plague, each day signalling a new battle against the rising infection infestation. Second is the return of the skeletal remains of a sister who left the community decades before to minister to deprived women in Thailand, then disappeared, presumed murdered, 
Finally, a troubling visitor to the monastery pulls the narrator further back into her past. With each of these disturbing arrivals, the woman faces some deep questions. Can a person be truly good? What is forgiveness? Is loss of hope a moral failure? And can the business of grief ever really be finished? A meditative and deeply moving novel from one of Australia's most acclaimed and beloved writers. Oh my gosh, a mouse plague? A skeletal remains of a sister? And a troubling visitor. I'm going to read this one and James and try and get that done in the next two weeks. So that's totally achievable. But um, I think Charlotte Wood is the first Australian to be nominated for the Booker in 10 years. So that's quite an achievement. So I'm looking forward to that. And then the last book I've got recently is A Thousand Feasts from Nigel Slater. And this was one that I had on pre-order. I actually thought it was going to be a little more Christmas related. I really did. But it's not. It's just a memoir. And I believe it's just based on notebooks and diaries and journals that Nigel Slater has kept over the years. And I think it might be really based a lot on travel these are just snippets it seems very like there's very small pieces like this is just one little paragraph whereas the other one is a little bit longer so there's some very small pieces in here there's a little bit of travel stuff in here this funny and sharply observed collection on the good bits of life often things that pass many of us by is utter joy from beginning to end I thought it was going to be about Christmas stuff, but I'm so glad that it's come and I'm looking forward to that one. And I think that might be in maybe another addition to my nonfiction November pile, which is growing. It is growing. And I'm not sad about it because I'm kind of loving a bit of nonfiction at the moment. But I'm, I'm hope, hope, hopefully I'll share that with you soon. I do love Nigel Slater's writing. I remember watching his, his cooking shows. His voice is just, he's got this beautiful timbre to his voice and the tone and I hear it when I read his writing it's a bit like if I read something by Matthew McConaughey I can hear his voice or if I read Ni Nigella Lawson I can hear her voice and it's the same or uh, Stanley Tucci I can hear the voice and I feel that with this so I think this is going to be really lovely and uh, memoirs about food in particular I think would be nice but there seems to be a lot of bits in here about Japan I'm going to Japan in a few months, so that'd be nice to experience a few moments like that. But those are what I read in November. Those are a few books that I'm looking forward to reading in, oh gosh, those are the books I read in October. Those are a few books I'm looking to read in November. Holy dooly, the next time I do this, it may be December and there may be a Christmas tree behind me and I'll be coming up to almost 12 months of YouTubing. Wow. Thank you so much for being here. I have added... Uh, lately my goodreads and my story graph links down below in the description so if you want to join me in real time and see what books i'm reading please join me there i update story graph in real time whereas goodreads i just kind of start a book and finish a book please feel free to join me over there i'd love to connect with you and thank you so much for joining me and i look forward to seeing you again soon bye